Thank you very much and good morning or good afternoon depending on which coast you're on. Um, Ed and I are thrilled about the upcoming Strata Conference and we asked a few of our presenters uh, to give us a preview of what they're up to and sort of give us the highlights of the event. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Strata is a conference O'Reilly runs that looks at the business of data, um, ubiquitous computing, new interfaces, and other aspects of uh, the quantified society we're quickly moving towards that are going to change all of our lives. Uh, it's been a real thrill putting together the curriculum and the content with Ed for these things, and a little later on, Ed and I are going to uh, chat about some of those things. Uh, but first, I want to give you uh, some earlier thoughts um, that we had on, on the conference as a whole. Um, and what I mean by towards the quantified society. Um, we are moving into a world where everything is collected, computed, analyzed. Every device that we wear makes us both a center, sensor and a system for output. Um, and uh, we are entering into a world where that data that we collect uh, and the data's results, which are pushed back to us, turn us into part of a big feedback loop. Um, essentially, we're entering a feedback economy uh, in which every one of us is both a sensor and an interface. So everything we do is grist for the mill of an algorithm that can help us to lead better, more productive, more interesting lives, but also carries with it a ton of uh, ethical uh, questions, privacy questions, and so on. Um, you know, I saw a tweet the other day about um, uh, the future is a decision about whether we want to be part of Brave New World or um, whether we want to be part of um, uh, 1984, the surveillance state. Um, or a state where uh, we're sort of um, being numbed by all the algorithms around us. And, and both of those are, are possible dystopian futures. And this is a very interesting time in, in human history to be looking at what happens when we instrument the world so all of us are both sensors and interfaces. The big data world uh, is only part of the story behind Strata. Uh, we really do believe that this convergence of these three big tectonic shifts, uh, big data, the idea that we can take a ridiculous amount of information and process it in near real time, ubiquitous computing, the idea that computers are with us from birth to death uh, as, we, uh, as we carry out our lives no matter where we are, and new interfaces, both interfaces for collection of data and new interfaces for the display and comprehension of that data, are going to fundamentally change most aspects of our lives, how we live, how we love, how we work, and how we play. And this is going to lead us to some uh, significant adjustment, and Anna and I are going to talk about those a little bit later in the day. But first, I want to talk to you about what I call uh, big data's odd couple. I think the big data has an odd couple in it, and that many of the debates we're going to see in the coming years around the quantified society are actually consequences of this. Um, first of all, uh, if you think about an odd couple, you generally have, in, in the classic story of the odd couple, you have one person who's kind of scruffy and messy, and one person who's kind of clean and organized, and I really do think that we see both of those worldviews in the world of big data. We see um, people who want everything structured and properly tagged and classified with the right metadata and the right schema, and they have a very valid point that the better you identify and label data on entry, the better it is. And then they see people who say this is simply too much data to comprehend, so we may as well just try and write algorithms that can parse through it. There's no point in trying to make sense of it ourselves. Let's let the, the machines find the signal-to-noise ratio. Uh, find the, the signal within the noise at a ratio we can't comprehend. Uh, we've seen humorous versions of this uh, in the real world already. Um, here's a classic one of someone that's a little scruffy and someone's a little well organized. Of course, um, that's not the complete picture. Um, but I do think that these two worldviews are something we're going to have to deal with. Um, the one side is uh, to polarize this discussion. One side says, look, if I could just label everything and find the perfect schema for it, the world would be at a better place. And these are sort of semantic idealists who expect that everyone is going to be as fervent in tagging their world as they are and want to um, encourage the world to label everything on input because that's the only way we'll make sense of it. The other end of the spectrum uh, is the uh, unstructured nihilists. Um, whenever I'm thinking of these guys, I think of uh, Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park, where the um, I think the owner of the island says uh, that Jeff Goldblum's character has a deplorable excess of personality. Uh, tends to be what we think of as the scruffy neckbeard, solve everything with an algorithm. Uh, and they say, look, the world is complex and fuzzy. There's no need to clean up after myself. I'll make the machine smart, and they'll point me at what's best. Uh, these are sort of the I believe in nothing nihilists um, that, that value unstructured information but can mine it with perfect algorithms. Uh, we've seen these 
these, these two models play out in a number of places. I mean, if you simply go and compare, for example, um, Google to um, Google to Yahoo, uh, that's a pretty good example of early Yahoo was very directory focused and you had editors that were putting things into the right taxonomies and it was very much a discussion about which labels or which categories apply uh, versus an algorithm that harnesses all the page ranks and uh, all the page links out there to try and discern what the most important or valuable content is out there. Um, and if you look at the discussion about Wolfram Alpha, um, Wolfram Alpha is a, a knowledge system deals directly with raw, precise information. So if you ask Wolfram Alpha a question, it knows nothing until it knows the correct answer, and then it's 100% sure of the correct answer. You can say, what is the weight of the earth in blue whales? And assuming it knows the word weight and the weight of the earth and the weight of a whale, it can tell you the answer. It's unlikely you can Google search the weight of the earth in blue whales and find a correct answer, whereas um, the IBM approach that won Jeopardy was much more, let's go find all the answers in the world and decide which one is the best one and then provide that as an answer. So it's never 100% correct, but it's mostly 99% correct. And much of this debate about structure versus chaos, about um, the clean, messy, odd couple of big data, is going to be about which of these two work best. And of course, the reality is that they work best when they work together, just like the um, sitcom from which I took the name. But I really do think that many of the debates we're going to see have to do with this odd couple of big data. So without further ado, um, I'm going to lead into the rest of our presenters today. We have a great lineup for you. Um, we also have a last minute replacement. Uh, Noah Alinsky has agreed to join us to talk about his design thinking for effective data visualization uh, when one of our previous speakers had a problem and couldn't join us. But we do have a look at issues like privacy, uh, issues like large data analysis, uh, visualization, user experience. Uh, this is just a sampling of some of the things we're going to be talking about in Santa Clara uh, early, uh, late next month, and we'd be thrilled if you could join us there, and we're glad to have you here today. If you have questions, please uh, shut them out on uh, Twitter using the pound Stratacomp hashtag or uh, in the group chat here, and we'll be happy to answer them. And I'm now going to turn things over to our first speaker, uh, John Wilbanks, to talk about pretty simple data privacy. John. Thanks, everybody, and uh, welcome to the, the, the webinar. I apologize in advance. You may hear a small child in the background because I've got my 10-month-old here um, speaking of privacy issues. So the reason we titled this Pretty Simple Privacy was to be a little provocative. The idea is that uh, privacy is something we've made incredibly complex. If you look at the privacy policies for organizations or websites, they're almost incomprehensibly complicated. And a lot of that comes from the fact that privacy itself is something that, that has become a complicated idea. And I like to start with what Dana Boyd talks about, which is contextualizing privacy is, is, is something that happens inside certain social situations. Um, and it has to do with control. So it has to do with control over information. It has to do with things like human dignity, intimacy, the ability to restrict access to information. And it also has to do with things like harm prevention, um, fear of exploitation, fear of discrimination. And so privacy is this sort of umbrella term for the rights and the controls um, that stitch together all of these different concerns. Uh, but what really brings it all together is it's something that we think we should have and that we should have the power to do something with. And we often don't. Um, and so as Ed pointed out, we've got this really unprecedented capacity to gather data about ourselves. Um, so we can actually gather data off of our smartphones. We can wear a Fitbit and gather data about the way that we sleep or the way that we run. Uh, we can get our genomes. And increasingly, we have federal rights to our uh, medical records and other sorts of information that big institutions used to gather about us um, that wasn't available to us previously. And I'm not talking as much about sort of typical privacy web data, the things that Facebook tracks or that Google tracks, uh, but the sort of data that we can actually get about ourselves. And what we don't have is the agency to decide what gets done with that data about us. And, and when I talk about agency, what I mean is the right to actually decide um, who can exploit my data, the right to decide um, who has control over access to my data. Um, and in many cases, it's, it's difficult to figure out how to create that agency because we have federal laws that govern uh, the movement of health data about ourselves, and we sign terms of use with websites that govern how the data they collect about us is, is managed. So in many cases, it's hard to figure out how to create that sort of agency. 
And when we're talking about web stuff, uh, for the most part, it, it comes in through APIs and automated data collection. Uh, so you can see just massive amounts of data get collected about you by pretty much any website you use. Most of the apps that you use gather data about you. There are service providers to app developers that manage and standardize the sorts of data that get collected about you. Uh, but if you actually tried to dig through the terms of use on those, um, they're as complex as the Apple iTunes terms, terms of use, uh, which has buried in them clauses that you've probably never read that forbid you to use iTunes to make nuclear bombs and wage chemical warfare. So there's been a movement in the web data privacy world to simplify understanding of privacy policies. These were created by a guy named Aza Raskin um, while he was working with Mozilla to provide iconic visual representations of what's inside a website's privacy policy. The idea was not that websites themselves would, would use these, but that users could come along and bolt them onto a privacy policy so that you could visually understand if your data, um, it can be used only for the intended use or could it be used for purposes you don't intend? Could it be sold or not? Could it be given to advertisers or not? And could it be given to law enforcement um, with or without legal process and how long it will be kept and so forth? So that's one way you can go, is to simplify the understanding of these complex processes, because that begins to give you a little bit of agency to decide whether or not you want to sign the terms of use and join a certain website. Um, but it doesn't really get at the problem of what if you'd like to have your data used for research purposes. Um, and this is something that people tend to think about when they think about science, when they think about your genome, your health record, or your energy data. Um, but it, it occurs with with your social network data as well. So this is a, a, a guy, Jason Kaufman, from the Berkman Center at Harvard, um, who did research into the sociology of what was happening on Facebook. And because the users had no agency to opt into a research project, he wound up on the front page of the Chronicle of Higher Education accused of breaching the student's privacy. And all he was trying to do was to do what scientists have always done, which is to examine uh, the interactions among people and try to understand what that means about our society. It gets even harder when you start looking at genetic information. So this is my 23andMe profile. So obviously I'm, I'm, I'm waiving a certain amount of my privacy by showing it to everybody here and archiving it. And what you can see is that um, I have an elevated risk, uh, particularly of prostate cancer, psoriasis, and Alzheimer's disease. Now, federal law makes it very difficult for me to provide this to a researcher um, in the way that we think about using the web to provide information to people, uh, because if I haven't provided what's been certified as informed consent, researchers have to assume they have no right at all to use my data. Now, everyone who can harm me or exploit me or discriminate against me based on this information pretty much already has a legal right to it. It's in my health records. Uh, the cost of doing my genotype is less than the cost of running uh, significant amounts of blood tests at this point. So this is not information to which um, prevention of access is going to really benefit. Indeed, it's information to which increased access may well help me because it might lead to an understanding of how to mitigate these diseases to which I am subject uh, at a higher risk. So what this panel is going to be about at Strata, at Strata is really to say, how do we provide simple methods to provide agency for people who have data about themselves to opt into research? So we're going to be looking at issues of consent, of data portability and data interoperability, um, and we're going to also be looking at how researchers are actually taking advantage of some of the data that is out there that's clearly available to do research. And what we're going to propose is that, that if you can provide agency to the individual, uh, and if you can provide the rights of data access to the individual, so that, so that any given person, she has the right to her own data about herself, that she can make a decision to say, yes, I'd like this data available for this researcher, no, I don't want this data available to that researcher, or maybe, which means that we can have a negotiation. And that begins to give us some simple frameworks to think about the way that people who have the data about themselves can make it available for scientific research. And the idea is that the user will decide what data they'll provide to the researcher. Rather than um, having the deal be done with a researcher in Facebook, I would have my Facebook data, I would make it available and mark it as available, and the researcher can come and get it from me instead of having to negotiate a deal with you know, Facebook's chief privacy officer. And it, what it's really about getting towards, if we're going to get to pretty simple privacy, is clarity of the terms so we get away from these 95-page documents. Uh, or if we can't, we at least provide user interfaces to them. And then agency to decide how data gets used. And then the third thing that, that's really important is the idea of portability, which is I shouldn't have to do this process of agency and clarity for every website, everywhere, 
every genotype I get, every health record. I should be able to go through this process as few times as possible and then make those usage rights that I've created for myself portable so that they travel with me instead of being locked up website by website. Now, at the actual panel, we're going to have uh, three presenters. The, we're going to have Betsy Mazzello, who is in the Google Policy Group um, and who works specifically on issues of privacy. Um, so she's going to be there to talk about how Google is working to provide that agency to users to download their data and, and take it and make it portable, um, as well as to talk generally about Google's policy efforts in this space to enable users um, to take some of that agency and have that data about themselves. Uh, we're also going to have Caitlin Thaney from Digital Science. Digital Science is a, is a startup inside Macmillan Publishing, which is working on providing funding and support for companies and projects that are trying to actually wrangle together big and open data to do interesting work. And so they'll be able to talk specifically about the pain that researchers face in trying to go through the negotiation process to get access to data about people um, and to data that might well be identifiable. Um, it's an incredible burden on the researcher to have to go through complicated regulatory processes just to access information to ask questions, um, to questions to which we don't really even know the answers yet. Um, and last, I'll also talk about my project, which is called Consent to Research. Uh, Consent to Research is about providing a standardized, portable way to opt into a research regime with your genotype and your health information. Um, and we're going to look at what we've learned out of that project and, and talk about some of the lessons and, and see how those might apply back to science more generally through digital science and to uh, what's gathered about us on the web through, through sites like Google. Um, and so if you would like to join us, it's going to be on March 1st at 1130 uh, in the Santa Clara uh, Stat Strata Conference. And if you'd like to follow either Betsy or Caitlin or myself, here's how you can find us. We'll be talking about this in the weeks before the conference, and we look forward to, to hearing more from you. Thanks.